Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for the Making Progress channel. Today's video number 45, filed under productivity and work, though it expands to way more than that, is uh, how to take criticism. How to take criticism. I have already written this one, so it will be up in a few videos. Um, how to give criticism for the best effect is also coming in. But first, we're going to talk about how to take it. First, let's talk about what criticism is. It can be interpreted in a few ways. But one of the ways I like best is when someone lets you know that what you're doing or creating or portraying, whatever your output, whatever your produce is, whatever your interaction with them is below their standard and quote unquote, do better is kind of the intent of all criticisms or most of them anyway. And yeah, do better is a way to get called out as an insane leftist and no one's just going to talk to you after that. So don't tell people do better. But that's kind of the intent of most criticism. And in a deeper sense, most of the people that criticize you are trying to help you get better because why the hell would they tell you, hey, you should work on this if they didn't care enough to type out those words on an Instagram DM? They care at some level. They absolutely care. And self-criticism, when you criticize yourself, is you trying to make yourself better. So it's coming from a pretty good place in most cases. And I think this is a pretty great way to see criticism if you are the person being criticized, but that doesn't mean all criticism is necessarily good criticism that you have to agree with. So let's talk about really quickly how criticism can be wrong. And there's a few ways in which criticism can literally just be not a good idea to follow through on. First example or first type is when the standards that you're shooting for are not the standards other people hold you to. There's a mismatch. You're being criticized essentially on the wrong thing. You might be shooting for lower standards, for example. Let's say that you're a natural bodybuilder and doing pretty well. And someone's like, dude, you don't look like Ronnie Coleman. So come on, you need bigger shoulders. Like, well, yes, that bodybuilder has on all the drugs in the world for a decade and a half. I'm drug free. And so you're just judging me by the wrong standard, right? It's like if your kids make a little like, you know, radio flyer car out of planks and fucking some little cart and you're like, yeah, but you know, formula cars go 230 miles an hour. So keep it up, kid. It's like, geez, that's not really a realistic critique for two eight-year-olds working on a little mini go-kart, right? So sometimes people just use outlandish reference points. You might be shooting for different standards than people assume. For example, you've really been working on your calisthenics shit. You can do fucking pull-ups and uh, all this other crazy stuff, tons of dips, kind of cool one-arm shit. And someone tells you like, hey, man, like, you know, your V taper could be a little bit more pronounced. They just don't know that you're not a bodybuilder. They have no idea. They think all muscle training people are all the same category and they all want to look a certain way. That's like, um, you know, asking a pro bodybuilder, like, so like, what are your best lifts in competition? He's like, I'm, I'm sorry. You think I'm a power lifter? That's totally cool. I'm not that strong. I'm actually a bodybuilder. I just flex my muscles. So they're going to criticize you on this, but that's really not even what you do. So calisthenics people that hear things about their physique, they're like, yeah, cool, cool. But did you see the, the kipping pull-ups that I did? I'm like, oh, actually, those are really sweet but you need more lats or something. Different critique. Another one is you might be shooting for higher standards very, very commonly. So for example, you take a, a top pro bodybuilder and he weighs 280, but he's a huge frame. And there's people that weigh more than 280 on stage at the Olympia. He's a big frame. His best would be if we weighed 310 pounds, right? He's well on his way. He's on his way up. But you give him the criticism or the feedback of, dude, you're big enough, man. You need to work on your lines and your balance. It's like, yeah, but you have no idea what big enough really means. You didn't think through this. You didn't know what I was doing. You haven't analyzed my frame. My coaches and I and all the other top judges in the federation, they're like, yeah, this guy needs like at least 10 or 15 pounds more muscle. So your critique is well, well taken, but it's just beside the point. Your standards are lower than mine are. So uh, no big deal. Now, you don't have to say this to people, but in your own head, you can make sense of criticism that just doesn't always hit the mark. Sometimes your own self-critical standards are just not logical for your long-term goals. So like some criticism that comes from your own mind back into your own mind, it's also wrong. Not every one of your paranoid, should I be doing better situations is right on and many of them are going to be wrong. For example, to me, something that I get in my head all the time is I need to work harder. I need to work harder. But an objective analysis by myself and my wife and about everyone else in my life is like, you have chronically demonstrated a tendency to work too hard and get burnt out and get sick 
and need to pick yourself up back off the ground. And you do that part just fine. But is there really a reason to suffer so needlessly and take on so much damage and burn your career at two ends of the fucking candle? You're just overdoing it. There's just overdoing it is a possible thing to do. But if your brain says, dude, you're underdoing it, but really you're overdoing it, you're just off in the wrong direction. The criticism of I'm not working hard enough can just be fundamentally wrong. The more accurate criticism is you need to relax more. Right now, folks, I'm getting ready for a bodybuilding show, but I'm like nine-ish weeks out. I need eight full weeks of the rest of this prep. So this week, my coach, uh, Jared Feather, IFB Pro, he told me to eat high calories, to do active rest, deload from training, very little training really heal at a deep level, which also means less intellectual work. So right after this video, I'm supposed to be taking a Tuesday afternoon to do nothing, just chill with my wife and fucking relax and watch videos and go shopping. And I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with my life? I didn't get this level of success. I didn't build these habits to like switch off, but switching off is what has to be done. So the criticism I had that I'm feeling right now as I talk to you about what I should be doing enough is just logically incorrect. Not all criticisms are logically correct. And when they're logically incorrect, Taking them is probably a bad idea because you'll just be more incorrect. Sometimes the critic misunderstands your intent or your produce, what it is you've created to be criticized, and thus the criticism just doesn't apply. Here's an example. Every now and again, uh, someone uh, in comments or whatever on the uh, RP Strength YouTube channel where maybe you know me from and maybe if you don't, just Google that. There's a lot more of me talking about muscle stuff will say something to the effect of, dude, enough with the jokes, stick to the info. And like, that is bad criticism because it misses the point of the channel. The point of the channel is really can be summed up in one statement. It is in a lighthearted, comedic way, teach people how to do better with building muscle and losing fat and getting healthier and better shape. It's in the brand of the channel to do the comedy. Now, a good criticism would be like, hey, your jokes aren't funny enough. Get funnier jokes, you dumb asshole. Love it. Respect. Always trying to do better. Uh, great critique. But no more jokes literally means radically alter the mission of your channel. Like, what? Really? You know, that might be a fine criticism, but we've given that some thought. Matter of fact, we used to have a channel for a long time that had fewer jokes. I intentionally crammed my shit just so I could stick more to the science, and we had a lot less viewers and followers. Turns out there's lots of people out there that can give you really good advice in a boring, dry way. I managed to, you know, you know, I'm saying scoot in a few jokes about fist fighting grandma, and people seem to think that's nice. And so that's kind of the brand of the channel. And that's just what we do. And if someone's like, well, you should be doing this totally other thing, like it's 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 similar to being like, you know, like an American football player, you sit next to him on the plane and they're like, you know, NFL pro. And you're like, hey, man, like you're considered hockey. You should do hockey. They're like, what? all right, thanks, man. <laughs> Am I really that bad at American football? Like, no, no, you're fine. You have your upsides and downsides. But hockey is where I think you'd be the best. Like I'm 33 years old. Are you out of your fucking mind? You will get criticisms like that absolutely from people. So you have to be ready for the fact that some people just don't really know what you're up to and they don't understand what it is you're doing. And so their criticisms are totally, totally wacky. And in the sort of penultimate way that criticisms are sometimes not that great is they're phrased in a what I would call less than helpful way. So like, you suck. I mean, that's a comment I get on Instagram every now and again. I'm just, it's not really actionable there for me to do. Maybe I can increase the duration and effort of my sucking. Ha <laughs> ha. Take that, Scott the Video Guy. You ready for a ride after this? Shit. Listen, Scott the Video Guy has needs. Physical. The physical needs of a man. They don't just take care of themselves. In any case... Sometimes criticism is just phrased in a way in which you'd have to really try to derive some kind of objective feedback from it. Like, fuck you is dope and funny, but it seems like criticism, but it's really just someone having a lot of feelings. It's not, there's nothing needy to it. So there's no reason to spend much time on it. So that's a way in which, or so, or so a few ways in which criticism can just be wrong. And so it's incorrect. But criticism has many ways in which it can make good points, in which it can be at least partially right. That's when it's really valuable to you. Let's take a look at a few of those and figure out how to take the criticism in the best possible way, just a little bit. First, criticism can literally factually accurate. Like, it's just true. And remember the genetic fallacy here. It has nothing to do with genetics, one of the worst names of all time. The genetic fallacy has to do with the root word genesis or beginning of creation of. The genetic fallacy states roughly, that it doesn't matter where an idea came from or who said it, 
the idea is right or wrong only on its own merits. If Jeff Nippert, super exercise science specialist on YouTube, says, you know, squats and leg presses are great for your quads, you'd be like, oh, that's right, Mr. Jeff Nippert, you're right. But if Adolf Hitler himself says squats and leg presses are superior for German peoples to do for their legs, you'd be like, oh, Hitler, you son of a bitch, but he's right. The truth is the truth, no matter who says it. And so if the criticism is literally true, you can't hate on it too much, and it's got a valid point in there somewhere. Another thing is that criticisms can post out or post out, can point out the most obvious areas of concern to you. So let me give you an example here. You are talking to your boss at work and you ask about how your work ethic is. And your boss says, it's great. You're a fucking star. I got to pull you back away from work every now and again. But your office can be a little bit more organized. All right, I got to go to this meeting. See, you're doing great. See, that's the interaction. Do not ignore this. He gave you a criticism. It's that your office needs to be more organized. It's top of your boss's mind for a reason. I guarantee you he didn't just make it up whole cloth. If he did, you need to get and get a new job. Don't work with people like that who are insane. But yeah, you learn two things. One, your work ethic's great. Hey, be proud of yourself. Party this weekend. Two, before you party this weekend, clean your fucking office up on Friday so it looks nice. So that the boss, when he's giving new employees a tour of the company, doesn't have to scoot around your office. They're like, what's down there? Like, oh, that's Frank. He's the best. You need data science shit, you go to Frank. Like, can we see his office? Like, you don't want to see his office. Trust me. If you end up working here, see it as little as possible. It'll be great. It smells in there. I don't know what kind of fucking cockroaches are evolving in there, right? No, 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 no. You just got a criticism for free. And it pointed out the area of concern that was most obvious to the person who it's most pertinent to, which is your boss. And of course, to you. So it's great. If that criticism was never rendered, you might have never caught on. If people don't critique you, you may just be none the wiser and you walk the world as an ugly, barely literate man make, trying to make sense of reality. Me. Because my friends are all fucking pussies. Scott the guy's not even my friend. They don't ever tell me the real deal. They don't ever cut me that real shit. Just kidding. That's all my friends do for the love of fucking God. And to that point, another point, criticism can come from people that don't care if they offend you. And that's ultra valuable because – it might give you an area to improve that folks around you didn't address. And why didn't they address it? Because usually your friends aren't mean assholes. Like if, if Scott's video guy asked me to, to do a full on total critique of everything I could come up with, I'm sure I could come up with some fucking heinous shit. But nine times out of 10, when I talk to Scott, I'm not trying to critique the guy. He's my friend. I'm trying to have a good time. And so sometimes criticism can be seen as real curt. Like what the fuck? Who the hell are you to say that about me? But if they don't care if they offend you, sometimes people say totally wrong shit, wacky shit. Sometimes they say true shit, right shit. That you're like, yeah, my friends never told me that. And you look at your friends, you're like, is this true? And they're like, I'm not going to say it's true. It's not like, it's like not true. You're like, all right, fine, it's true. Got it. Thanks, fellas. Thanks so much for being honest with me. And they're like, look, I'm not trying to tell you some shit. Like, I didn't even know you could do anything about, you know, the situation. Just going to shut the fuck up about it. But somebody rude could give you the gift of telling you, hey, this is a thing that people polite around you would have never told you. And now I'm telling you, it's awesome. Sometime I'll get Scott, the video guy, to do one of these confessionals on here. He's got a really great story about that. He's never going to tell it because he's a goddamn coward. Scott, you know what story I'm talking about, right? No more Scott. So many jokes I could make. I'm just going to shut the fuck up and give you that sweet, sweet anonymity that you want. Another thing about criticism in a way that it can be right and helpful is it can point out areas of potential improvement that you didn't even know about. Not necessarily rudely, just in general. That's a big deal. It kind of ties into the uh, couple points uh, that made just before. Now, there's a special case here we have to talk about. The case of repeated nasty criticism from a given person. And I have at least three things to say about that. First thing is if you get repeated nasty criticism from the same person, that can tell you that they're, they have a bigger issue with you that's worth broaching in its own time. It's not just one offs. They got something against you because it's coming all the goddamn time. Maybe that's something to chat with them about if you're in that kind of position. It can also tell you that most times they're not having a good time in their head. 
In my experience, the number one correlate, most predictive thing you can say, most predictive thing you can say about someone who's rendering harsh, unrequested criticism, all YouTube comments that are critical, is that these people just are not having a good time in their head. In my earlier part of my exercise science career, when I was a little bit Facebook famous, I reached out and spoke with and physically over the phone, over DMs, in comment sections to the people that were the most vocally critical of me. And I learned a lot of things. One of them was that a lot of these people are just having a real bad time in their head. Think about when you're most likely to be critical. When you're rushing at the store and you're late for work and someone bags your shit wrong, you're like, God damn, what the fuck? But if you just got promoted and you're just going to the store to get a box of fucking wine and they're like, hey, sorry, I bagged this wrong. I'm going to rebag it for you. Like, take all the time you want. No worries, buddy. We're all doing our best. When you're most critical is probably when you're hurting the most or you feel least accomplished yourself the most. And I found that most really harsh, insane, nasty one-on-one critics, they're just not having a great time in their head. And you, how do I say this best? It might be helpful for you to know that, that they're having a bad time in their head, not just just a random Tuesday. And maybe you can reach out to them to help them deal with difficulties. Let's say it's a parent or a sibling that's given you consistent, nasty criticism recently. Reach out to them. Be like, dude, what's going on? What's up? Don't even bring up the criticism. Be like, how are you doing? They just start crying. They're like, I have not been doing well. And you're like, holy shit, thank God I noticed the criticism. I came in. Something's wrong here. And, or... You just learn not to take their nastiness so seriously because it's just an expression of their angst. Like, real talk, fellas, probably I'm not outing myself too much. I don't think, fuck it, fuck it, I'll say it. It's all fucking God honest truth. If Scott the Video Guy and I ever see like a real nasty critic just really go at it with mostly incorrect bullshit, we just have like a phrase for that. Like, incel's gonna incel, man. Like, this is just the guy who's nothing and no one in the dark basement and he's just cramming keys at how big of a piece of shit you are, you know, it's not a person to take super seriously. It's just very angsty. Like I used to get really pissed off at the online criticism. And then I met more people in real life that were of that personality type. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, you're like a simultaneously skinny and overweight goth kid. Barely open up their fucking mouth to speak in public and don't ever look anyone in the eye. (laughs) Fuck was I taking you seriously in real life? Not that those people don't demand to be taken seriously, but Kind of no one does when they're being nasty pieces of shit and criticism and them last place. So sometimes people just having a bad time in their heads. They're just having a bad time in their heads. You don't need to take it super well. Some people that are just nasty, nagging critics, even after you've broached the subject a few times with them, potentially directly, at some point you might need to make a decision on the margins. That you just they just make fewer or less frequent or less long, lower duration, regular appearances in your life. Because some people just be like that. They're just fucking either going through a life thing or going through a forever thing. We're just fucking nasty and really critical and not in a fun, super helpful way. And it's tempting to try to change people to make them better. And sometimes that works on the margins. But changing them is sometimes really difficult and sometimes just unrealistic. It's realistically almost impossible. One of the big life lessons I've learned so far between being a young adult and being an adult adult, I'm going to be 40 probably by the time this video comes out, I'm really close, um, is that in my own experiences in my adult life, no matter your really great intentions, adult people are pretty hard to change. You might get marginal small changes, but the fundamental core of their personality and way of interacting It's going to stay pretty goddamn stable, at least for a while, unless they take a deep inner journey to try to change it. That can have big effects, but that's not on you to do. That's on them to do. So sometimes you just have people in your life that just don't, this square peg round hole situation where they're just pieces of shit and everyone around you is like, why is that? Why do you invite that guy to hangouts? He's just a fucking asshole. And you're like, yeah, he's Bob. I don't know. I've been friends with Bob for forever. And their friends are like, oh, listen, we're here, but it's weird. You think about it. You're like, I'm going to skip a party no Bob for this hangout and the hangout's the best hang you've ever had because Bob's not there. And you just start really thinking about it. Do, do I really need this shit in my life? Guys, I'm going to say some fucked up shit. You don't choose your family. You don't. You're born into the shit. Some of your family members are to be there with you forever. 
love and trust till the day you die. Other members of your family, especially extended family, you for sure, for sure didn't choose in any capacity. They're just curmudgeonly pieces of shit. You just need to talk to them very little or hardly at all. That's a situation you can come to and realize, you know, I, I do appreciate the criticism, but I'm good on this fucking front. No thanks. And another really important value to good criticism, I love this one personally, is it can point out your own sensitivities. If a particular criticism really hurts to hear, it might be worth exploring why. And either working on the issue or just being more mindful of it. Like, if you tell me, dude, you're like, you're short. I'm like, okay. Like, no, seriously, dude, like, you're like five, six. I'm like, yeah. Is there like something else here that I can take value from? It doesn't bother me at all. It never really did. I never wanted to be taller. I don't know why. I just never got that memo. I remember like finding out like literally a few years ago that girls like liked taller guys. And I was like, I'm glad I didn't know that most of my life. It explains all the girls not fucking me, I guess. That and the obesity and the halitosis and the lack of social skills, no money. Jesus Christ. Scott, how did I ever get laid at all? I'm not sure you have. Happy. <laughs> I'm not sure you have. Happy accidents, I call them, Scott. Dick. But uh, if you tell me like, hey, Mike, um, in close-knit social interactions, we're having a good time. You can kind of be a little egotistical and self-centered and a bit overwhelming. Like you talk a little too much about your own bullshit and people kind of want you to shut up a little more. That hurts. Should hurt. And it does hurt. And I've received criticism like that on occasion from close friends. And I was like, oh, wow, my heart. But that's something for me to do about. Um, I can be mindful of it and I can work to be low key and kind of turn Dr. Mike down a little bit. I'm a lot, if you guys can't tell. Sometimes I turn the fucking thing down. So. If I'm not sensitive to being called short, whatever, no problem. Nobody lost, nobody found. If I'm sensitive to being called an egotistical, self-centered asshole who needs attention, yeah, yeah, that's something for me to pay attention to. Thank God somebody said that. Imagine if no one ever said it. You would have spent 10 years with your friends that you thought you were best friends, and when you're not around, like, oh, thank God Mike's not here. He'd be yapping up a fucking storm, that stupid idiot, comma, Jew. Whoa, what the hell? Jesus Christ, friends. Scott, I know you say shit like that. We're not even getting into your bullshit. All right. I'm sorry. We're going to get canceled, you said? Yeah. Guys, if Scott and I could use our true racial humor on the channel, we would be both canceled and probably killed in real life. But it's all jokes, isn't it? So we're going to save some of those for another time when we're not canceled. Let's talk about a five-step system to use criticism to make yourself better. Because that is the member. That's the intended point of most well-meant criticism. It's even the low-key, not consciously, but subconsciously intended point of not well-intended criticism still makes you better. Let's take a look at how we've got incoming criticism. How do we use it to get better? That's actually the whole point of this video. Here we go. Five steps. Step one, evaluate how much true merit the criticism has. And this is always a spectrum. The spectrum starts at, holy shit, this is mega true, like, fuck, this is a real thing. This criticism hits home like crazy. All the way down the other end of the spectrum, which is like, this is literally the opposite of the truth. Like, I don't know, good criticism for me, like, hey, Mike, like, I know this is kind of strange, but like your head doesn't look like weirdly shaped and oddly muscular enough. I think you need to like take more growth hormone. I'd be like, okay, thanks. Listen, that's great. But you know, there's other super mega true guy like, hey, Mike, you know, you talk about yourself too goddamn much. Like, damn, facts. I need to shut the fuck up more. And it's everywhere in between. So when you get a criticism, remember, no genetic fallacy bullshit. Does not matter who made it. It does not matter what their intent was. All that matters is how it arrives to you. It's like taking some formatted text, copying it into another place and saying, copy with destination formatting or plain text only. Plain text that shit. Who cares who said it, who, how, how, why? What's the criticism? And where on that spectrum of, damn, this is big facts all the way to fuck that. This person is delusional. Where is that? First, you figure out where it is. Many criticisms will have some grain of truth at least and thus some value to you. And the ones that don't have any grain of truth, they neither have value nor are they going to take up any of your time in your head because like, this is just nonsense. All right. Step two, big important step. 
is to determine if and how much bandwidth you have to address the criticism. You have a finite amount of time in any given week of being yourself, work, leisure, self-improvement. And you already have shit you're working on and time to relax so that you can refresh for next week to work on yourself, to make yourself better, to progress over time. The number of criticisms that can be levied against you on a technical level are infinite, unless you're literally God and can do everything perfectly from the first time and always were and always will be, you can improve. Someone's, you're immortal and just like totally ascended, you can do whatever, and you're like, all right, guys, give me the criticisms. My guy's like, yeah, I got, um, you weren't always God, so like kind of work on like re-altering history. You're like, damn, the motherfuckers are holding me to a high standard. You do not have enough bandwidth to become better at everything. Hands down, end of conversation. You don't. So what do you do with that? First, you figure out how much bandwidth you have. You look at what's important to you in your weekly life and see how much extra time you have in order to address potentially this criticism. Then you take that criticism and you have other things you're working on in your to-do stack and you rank order it. Where does this go? Is this top of mind? Is this like, I need to work on this now as a big part of my life? Is it somewhere in the middle like, yeah, if I have time, I'll definitely slot it in because it's pretty important. Or is it somewhere real low down like, dude, if I had nothing to do that week, maybe I'll work on this criticism or this quality people are criticizing. But honestly, it's so low key. It's just beaten out by other priorities that I have that it's not a big deal. And you can see if you can work on the criticism based on where it falls. It could be delayed. You could just not address it now, but do it in your to-do notes and come back to it three weeks or three months later and be like, oh, yeah, that thing. And I'll have finally time to do something about it. Uh, or you just never address it because hundreds of priorities outrank. In your life, there are going to be criticisms that are a bigger deal and less of a big deal. And it's up to you to rank which ones you want to work on. And here's the thing. You can't work on them all. It's all just your top a few things you can work on in any given week, month, and year of your life. A few big rocks is how you get better in a meaningful way. Little teeny criticisms like blah, blah, blah. They're just distractions and noise. Let me give you an example. If I get a well-meant, intelligent criticism about how I approach YouTube, let's say we get some YouTube analytics guys, so maybe the people that work with Mr. Beast, and they sit down, Scott and I, and they're like, here's everything you're doing wrong with a YouTube channel. Oh my God. First of all, we're like taking notes as furiously as possible, recording that whole fucking call, all ears, fuck us, fuck what, fuck what we know, throw it all away. I want to hear all these fucking criticisms, and we're going to not just think about them. We're going to develop our, our, an architecture to change the very way we create our YouTube process to integrate the criticisms into that system. This is whole cloth change. Get us a fucking moon outside of Jupiter, put a military base there to test our new YouTube. That's how fucking serious that shit is. Whereas if I get a criticism about my fashion choices, it just goes one ear out the other. First of all, I don't give a fuck. Clearly, GBRS, you guys are the shit. It's a free t-shirt and they're fucking awesome. Uh, I don't care what goes on my body as long as my genitals and asshole don't point into the public in such a way that gets me arrested. That's really all I care about. I also don't understand fashion. I have no context. Like you could dress better. I'm like, I don't really know what that means. Oh, by the way, I don't care. Oh, and also I work from home on a video screen. It just doesn't matter. It just whole cloth doesn't matter. So some criticisms, fucking top of mind, change instantly, begin the process. Other criticisms, there's a time and place. Other criticisms, we're good. Because remember, I can be criticized on one trillion different things, and so can you, and they can't all be important. And most of them, you just have to be like, eh, don't give a shit, don't have the bandwidth. That's why step two of determining how much bandwidth you have, whether or not you're going to address it, is ultra important. Otherwise, these criticisms build up in your head. You just feel like, oh my God, I need to get better at everything. Sure, but need slash want slash what is realistic are all getting muddled. Choose the, the few things you're going to improve upon in any given week, month, or year. Do those well. If anything bubbles up to the surface that's number one, do it. If it doesn't make the top five or top three in your week, it's just not something you fucking hear at all. Step three, develop a plan to improve the criticized elements. That's pretty obvious. Step four, again, obvious, execute that plan. Step five, Check in with yourself, check in with the process, check in against metrics, and maybe even check in with your original critic to see if they note an improvement. This is especially true if um, 
It's optional, but it can be helpful, especially true if, if it's uh, a very meaningful relationship to you, or if it's in a formal setting. If your boss gives you a criticism last month about like, you have to do these TPS reports better, you start doing them better, you come back, you're like, boss, TPS reports? He's like, honestly, Frank, you're fucking killing it. This is amazing. Hey, awesome. Like, this is really good stuff. Uh, myself and uh, Scott, the video guy, were helped a ton uh, a little while back by Chris Williamson, who's awesome, help us uh, formalize our YouTube strategy a little better, kind of odds and ends type of stuff. Really, really, really instructive. And, and you know, I have checked back with Chris a few times to be like, hey, like, what do you think, man? And he's like, dude, you guys are crushing it. All the, the basics, you guys are doing super well. I love it. Because he could have said something else. He could have been like, and uh, uh, times when I've reached back to him, like, you guys are doing really good. I think you'd, this is the kind of shit that is, goes back into the YouTube cake baking. He's like, I think your, your head on the thumbnail could be even bigger. And Scott and I were like, is, you, you sure about this, man? Mike's head's already too big. And why would anyone want to see more of it? And he's like, dude, the data's in. We did it. Even more views. It works super great. So checking back in after the process can be an awesome thing. Another really good example is someone that's close to you. You know, your wife said that you're, that you don't spend enough time kind of, uh, you know, let's say, kind of watching the kind of shows and movies she likes. And it was like a thing she said. It was really well taken. You're like, oh, my God, baby, I, did, I thought you were cool with my shit. Oh, my God, no worries. And you make an act of effort to kind of like be like, hey, honey, what do you want to watch? And you guys know how women be. They're like, I don't care. But they're like, all right, we're watching Jean-Claude Van Damme marathon again. She's like, ah, she's not going to say it out loud because sometimes women be like that. So you come back around with her and be like, hey, baby, how have we been doing on the whole movies and TV shows or watching stuff that you like? She could be like, you know what? Like, it's been better, but we could do better. She could be like, just like, do better and then divorce. And then uh, she could be like, dude, it's honestly been way fucking better. And to be completely honest, like, I love it. And you're like a fucking changed man. And oh my God, glad you checked in. So this is a really good process here. Now, let's talk about we have this process of how to take criticism on a technical level. Let's talk about two more things. One, from an emotional interactive perspective, how not to take criticism, how to take it really poorly. I have some fun things to say there. And then how to process criticism from an emotional perspective and philosophical perspective in the best way possible. First, to the worst ways to take criticism. I have a couple of ideas here. One, two, three, four, four, four. First, a really bad way to take criticism is to take offense to it, personal deep offense. Now, look, sometimes you can't help it. You're going to get some feelings. Feel the feelings. I'm not trying to invalidate your shit. I know the fucking – Scott, what generation is this now? Generation Z. Did you want to say generation next, generation – Generation X. No, I meant next. I was a oh. Limp Biscuit quote. Generation X, generation strange. Gen what? No, they're not Z. They're some else, some other shit now. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I know that trying to invalidate the emotions of the current modern generation is the worst thing that anyone could do to you. So no, totally feel your feelings. Your feelings are valid and true because they're feelings and because you have them. That doesn't mean they indicate any truth out in the world. They just indicate that you're having a bad time. Don't give your feelings of offense more validity than they deserve. Because taking offense deeply and letting it linger and really redoubling, like, no, I should be offended is a gigantic waste of time almost everywhere and almost in every place. And it's a waste of your emotional resources. And it's a waste of you having a good time in your head. Taking offense to shit is lame as fuck. It happens. But as soon as it happens, you're like, okay, I'm admitting to myself, I got offended at that. And then you're like, okay, clearly it's hitting some kind of fucking something. And I got to think about that later. There's a big difference between that and really be like, I should be offended. How dare he? That is not productive. It makes for cool reels if you're a social justice warrior. No offense, social justice warriors. I know you're into that sort of thing. Taking offense, that is. <laughs> but um, it's much better to say, hey, I got offended. All right, let's work on the shit versus how dare that person. So taking offense to it is a road bump you have to get over to get to the other side to go, okay, now, now what? But if you're really caught up on offense, you may never get to that other side. How dare you? Someone tries to criticize you, you walk off because you're so offended and you're just out of their life. Like, all right, that's a missed opportunity to learn. That sucks. Next is don't try to vehemently argue your way out of the criticism. There is a time for discussion and argument, but that's usually after you've heard the whole criticism and introspected 
for yourself and cross-examine them and yourself and other factors of your life for more details to make sure there's really something, something substantive there. But especially if you get offended at some shit and you hear it right away, you might be tempted to just argue right around. It's like, oh, I'm really good at arguments. Watch this. I'm going to win this one. Someone criticizes you. You're like, no, fuck you. I'm going to turn the shit around on you. Not how it works. First, you steel man their critique. How could they be even more right about me than they think? That's steel manning. That's constructing. Instead of a straw man, you light on fire and burn, pretend that's their argument or their criticism. You make a steel man that's impossible to burn. You go, okay, this is the best possible way that their criticism could have been meant. And this is the most accurate way it could have been true about me. Then you red team that criticism. Okay, how can this criticism be right? We got that. Now, how can it be wrong? Often, you do this just to yourself. It doesn't require an interaction with a person because usually when a person is critical to you, maybe they haven't thought about it very long. It's up to you to think about it a long time. They're like, hey, your breath smells. What are you going to say? No, no, it doesn't or it only smells for you because you're. I take bad breath pills when I'm around you because fuck you, I hate you. That's all nonsense. You got to be like, oh, all right, thanks. And then later, you're like, oh, am I not brushing my teeth enough? Um Am I eating too much feces out of the trash? It's a thing. It's free. But am I going to give that up? Um, you got to think about it yourself. Justifying yourself live in the moment to others is often a big ass waste of time and resources. And it makes you seem needlessly disagreeable and combative. It makes it seem that you're not listening. And it makes it seem that you don't care about that person. When someone's giving you especially real world criticism, when they give a fuck about you, arguing back instantly about it is lame as fuck because it says, you're wrong, I'm right, go fuck yourself. That's not what you're trying to put out in the world. You want to put out in the world an imagining that no one is perfect, including yourself, and that every criticism you get could be a criticism that you can improve upon. And so when someone's criticizing you, your first recourse shouldn't be to argue back against them, but it should be like, Yes. Yes. Keep going. Lay it on. How bad is it? Make it worse. Not only do I not wash the dishes like I said I would, I, I'm sometimes, some weeks I'm not even taking out the garbage. And I missed doing laundry last week. And the month before that, I didn't even mow the grass like I promised I would. Remember? They're like, yeah, actually, geez, I forgot all that. Holy fuck. Like, what else you got? How bad does it make you feel that I don't step up to the plate to do these responsibilities? Lay it on. So you get the whole fucking thing to chew on. Then you chew on it later. You find out what of that criticism is true, what of it is false. That's a whole different conversation at the end of the day. You come back to their critic later and say, hey, listen, thank you so much for rendering that criticism. Or you come back and like, hey, why don't you talk about roles and responsibilities? It turns out I do like 98% of the shit in this house and you do like 2%. I got tons of love for that. I think it's super cool. But maybe if we could find a better balance, like we could go forward. And they're like, dude, you're right. I criticized you for not doing all the shit that I ask you to do, but it's completely unreasonable for me to ask you to do all the shit. That could lead to a great conversation. Nowhere in that is as soon as they tell you, uh, hey, like, you know what I'm saying? You're not you know, doing laundry enough. You vehemently argue. Like, well, yes, I am doing laundry. I did it last week and I did it the week before. And you, hopefully they don't remember that three weeks ago you didn't. You, did, you remembered, but they didn't. Hopefully you can win an argument. Is it really worthwhile to win an argument? No, no. I'm here to tell you I've won plenty of arguments. I lost plenty of arguments. So when you win an argument, you get nothing. Nobody, I, I used to win all kinds of Facebook discussions against like uh, people in economics and, and politics. And I would like mark my stopwatch. Right? All right. The super hookers coming in to give me a congratulatory, congratulatory blowjob must be here any minute. I just wanted to be on Facebook. Nothing ever happened. I did it in real life. Also, nothing ever happened. So the temptation to just win at all costs and defend yourself is starting yourself down a train track, which ends in a fucking ravine that falls off. Don't even bother. Don't even fuck. It's tough. I know it's tough. And sometimes when you get really nasty, you can do the other really bad thing. Thing number three is attack the critic themselves. You'll see this in well, married couples that don't stay married for long. I'll put it this way. She'll say, well, look, you haven't been washing the dishes. Well, you haven't been taking out the garbage. Well, you haven't been mowing the grass. Okay, but the conversation is about you being criticized. Nothing they do has it anything to do with that. Remember the genetic fallacy. We take their criticism, brush off all that other context, text only. This is what you're doing wrong. Is it true? To what extent is it true? Is there something you can work on here? Can you steel man it? Can you red team it? Et cetera. At no point is 
they're a fight. At no point are we in combat. You don't have to do a missile volley back across their border. It's literally irrelevant and also needlessly sullies the situation for no good reason at all. It's insanely pointless. It's best illustrated, although there's many ways to attack a critic, it's best illustrated in the whataboutism fallacy. Whataboutism was perfected by communist propagandizers in Russia during the Cold War. And it was something to the effect of if you know anyone from the United States or free world was like, do you guys have super prisons in which you're holding millions of political prisoners and they just die of cold exposure? And then the Soviet propagandists would be like, but what about the ghettos in America? Pause. Does America have an inner city ghetto problem? Fuck yeah. Did it have one in the 70s and 80s when Russia did this shit all the time? Fuck yeah, of course, valid. What does that have to do with the prison complexes in Russia? Nothing. Couldn't they be like, you know what, facts, bro, we do imprison a lot of people. They don't because communists are fucking liars and sociopaths and literally evil. So don't bother with that shit. You're not one of these people. You're someone who's in a relationship, who's in a work dynamic, who's in a friend dynamic. And so attacking the critic just is a non sequitur. It's a non-starter. It just sours relations. It's no good. When someone criticizes you, you go, dope. All right. I'm going to, I'm definitely going to think about that. Any kind of answer like that is great. Any answer where you clap back at them, look, it makes for fucking sweet, like, you know, like confrontation in the hood videos and world star videos and great rap battles, but not a lot gets solved in that process. And people don't improve in that process. It's for other people to see. Um, not the thing you want. And lastly, and this is a big one, because right now I've been super harsh to you, the critic taker. You need to become better and stronger to hold all these ideas in your head. You not, you need to not lash out. You need to have some, some poise. True. But let me give you some credit on your side here. Don't let the criticism attack your deeper sense of self-worth and esteem. Criticism is noise. It comes from everywhere. And let me tell you, after getting a little bit popular on YouTube, holy fucking shit. Scott, do you want to just Google Mike Isratel critique for the next 10 hours and read it together? Mm-hmm. You son I'll of a bitch. I'm like, Reddit author S. Hoon. I'm like, what the fuck? You're like, oh, yeah, I've, I guess I've been, re- I've been writing a lot of these, man. It turns out 98% of my critics are just you under different usernames. That would, that would be hilarious and also very strange if we found out. Great Netflix documentary stuff, though. But this entire time, he's a very videographer, had an axe to grind. Scott, are we nothing because we don't have a Netflix documentary? Mm, that what are we going to do a documentary about? One of us has to get murdered, I guess. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> okay, so y- y- we can't make videos unless you're here. You can't get murdered. Who's gonna Who's gonna do the documentary if I can't narrate it? We got it. We got it. Yeah, yeah. I could say a lot more politically incorrect shit, but but I'm gonna get canceled. Shout out, Mike. Keep going with the talk. Criticism is everywhere. It is noise. It has functions. Potentially, you take it in, you improve yourself, and you move along. Hurting your feelings, brooding on your existential self worth, helps nobody criticisms other than, excuse me, sir. You're like, yes, your deep self-worth is totally lacking and they fuck off. You're like, whoa, that's both true and and a valid criticism and it attacked my deep self-worth. Most criticism is not like that. People will say all kinds of, people say the darndest shit. Let the criticism be heartfelt, but don't pay too much mind to it. At the end of the day, you are what you are. You're just trying to do your best. You know, like I've been laughed out of bedrooms before because my cock was both basically invisible and was not able to be erect. Did I take that poorly? Yes, I cried for days on end. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, when I go to my next sexual interaction, you know, your boy's bringing two things for sure, baby, because that's just who I am. One is Mr. Twinkie. I call him and the other one, he's soft. That's just bitches expect that sort of shit from me nowadays. I expect it for myself. All jokes aside, Scott, how much of that is a joke? Exactly. Largely true. What is that? All jokes have some element of truth. Um, You are what you are. And criticism doesn't have to impact your deep sense of value as a person because that's a core thing that never changes. Don't worry. I got some fucking talks for you in a couple of weeks about that whole thing. But criticism is a stick and move kind of process, right? 
if you get a random Delta Force guy stuck in an airport and there's terrorists that have taken over, maybe like six terrorists and one Delta Force guy. And he's like trapped in some kind of like, he's in like an office with a security guy and they have a couple extra shotguns. They throw him one. He's like, Ch-ch-ch. do you think he's like, oh man, these, these terrorists got to drop on me. I, I should have known my training prepared me for this. I, I'm so bad. I let all these people get hostage taken. Oh my God, I'm terrible. Oh fuck no. What does he do? He sticks and moves. He's like, we got a fucking objective. We got six targets. We got me. We got these guys. They're going to do some, some uh, cover fire to draw them out. And I'm going to fucking ping them. Maybe not with a shotgun, but whatever. Give me your fucking pistol. That's what's going to happen because the job is the job. The mission is the mission. And now is go time. Time for like self-worth and all that shit. That's all fucking nonsense. So when you get criticized, you think about, is there anything I can extract from here that's beneficial? If yes, extract, improve. If no, no big deal. People have all sorts of opinions and maybe even they're right. Maybe I am like, you know, not as great at writing essays as I want to be. That's true. But does that mean there's some kind of core thing to me that's broken and wrong? No, fuck no. Holy crap. And if you want that from people that don't know who you are at a deep level, you can't get it because they don't know that about you. They don't. So deeper self-esteem is really quite removed from this. Criticism should be taken in a kind of like, I just want to get better. Don't let it touch the deeper parts of you. That's what my dad said when he dropped me off at my pastor's house when I was five. I did my best. Scott, how did you do in that situation? Yeah, notice he's got nothing to say. He's crying right now, by the way, he's off camera. And texting his pastor. Lastly, the best ways to take criticism, we've already covered on a technical level. Now we're going to cover it more on a spiritual level. I have a couple points here. First, try to steel man every criticism. Steel manning is asking the question of how can this person be even more right than they thought? If the Russian Ministry of Defense says America is weak in missile defense, America's submarines suck, America's tanks suck, fine. But if you're the Secretary of Defense in the United States, you probably won't do this in public, but you're like, man, he has no idea how correct he is. We have holes in 50 other programs we're trying to plug in. Take all the criticism that comes to you that you're willing to entertain seriously and steal man it. How could this person be right? Don't get offend- offended. Don't get defensive. If the criticism is useless, super absurd, and ultra mean, just laugh with it. Pretend you're like a kid in the 1950s. Oh, boy. Well, that person sure has a lot of feelings. Gee whiz. That's it. That's it. You've disarmed everyone. I mean, who could possibly tell you something so mean that you wouldn't be like, all right, buddy. Like, I've had some fucking real nasty shit written about me uh, by people who I know for a fact are just having a really bad time. And I can't possibly take it seriously. There's nothing in there to take seriously. Like, well, most of them are things I can't repeat on YouTube, but. Your letter G, the short word after that, like, word up. <laughs> like, what am I supposed to do? Like, no, I do, like all people on a spectrum, have some homosexual tendencies, but <laughs> like, what? I don't even start that talk. You got to take a lot of really nasty, insane criticism from psychotic people. You just don't take it seriously. You'll save yourself a huge headache. I wish I knew that years ago. Next, if you're engaged in a serious interaction with criticism, ask for deeper insights and specifics. You don't want the criticism to be over soon. Like, hey, you need to be more organized. Like, okay, okay, no, I know, I know. I'm working on it. Okay, fine, 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 fine. I'm good. I'm good. I'm working on it. I'm good. Okay, no more. You don't want that. That's fucking dumb. You want the opposite. You want to go, okay. You said I'm not organized like I could be. And I know that fucking shit is true, bro. So thank you for telling me. Can you think of a couple of ways like that really presents itself? Like, is it my... um schedule timing stuff? Is it the fact that I'm not sorting my priorities well? Is it physically disorganized? Like, is my junk everywhere? Dude, oh my God. They could be like, oh, actually, well, now that you're asking me, you're pretty good about a few of those, but the one that your clothes are everywhere. That's all I mean is that you leave your clothes in the living room and we're roommates. Please stop doing that. Hey, as soon as you stop doing that, they're like, dude, you're the fucking man. They never say you're disorganized again because they never go in your room because they don't give a shit. Problem solved, so to speak. But if you know that disorganization is a big deal enough for your roommate to say it, maybe you will clean your room and Jordan Peterson will appear out of nowhere and go, Aah. Scott, what's a good thing for Jordan Peterson to say? I, got, I learned my Jordan Peterson impression from uh, Jeff Nippard. So blame Jeff. But I mean, like, how can you even clean your room if you're like, don't even live with a roommate? I mean, come on. I mean, if you're, are you even trying, bucko? Bucko. Bucko is critical to any Jordan Peterson impression. Look at you, your big growth hormone head. You're making fun of, of me on your stupid YouTube channel. It doesn't even have any followers. <sighs> Clean your room, folks. Next, 
ask for recommendations potentially on how to address that criticism. These might be anything from a complete roadmap. Your wife's like, hey, you need to do a better job with talking to your mother-in-law. And you're like, okay, can you tell me how to talk to her? She's like, I have a PhD in this shit. I've been doing this my whole life. This bitch is crazy. Let me tell you the top five things to talk about and how to talk about them. Top five things never to talk about and how to get yourself the fuck out of those conversations. I'm going to give you a, a goddamn codex for the shit. Holy fuck. Thank you, roadmap. Amazing. But they could be really bad advice that like the way people tell you to improve is actually wrong and you know it's wrong, but their intent is good and the criticism is still true. You'll know yourself and figure out yourself how to fix most things, but any further insight is great. And bonus point, that's not why we're doing it, but the bonus point is that the critic feels heard, which is a big deal in real relationships. And they not only feel heard like, okay, fine, I heard you out. They feel interested in, in. They feel like someone's interested in them, that you're interested in them, that you care so much about their opinion of you and how you're acting with them and interacting in the world. You want deep insights and recommendations for how to solve the problem. I mean, can you imagine if you crit everyone you criticize did this? You're like, um, hey, grocery bag boy, you're not doing this job right. He's like, oh my God, sir, let's go down the list. You know what? You're totally right. I even did a bad job with a customer before you. Uh, it's, you're like, oh, wow, he's steel manning himself. Um, and deeper inside specific, he's like, okay, so there's a couple ways to get the bags out. Do you think I should be stacking all the products together and then putting them in bags? Or do you think I should kind of go like a grab and go system? And, uh, and now he's asking you recommendations on how to dress it. You're like, fuck, I'm, gee whiz, I don't know how to do your job. I guess your job's pretty hard. I don't know how to fucking do it. Listen, you're doing a great job. Can they fuck off? Or they're like, actually, I used to be a bag stacker person. Here, you put this, the cereal's going first. Here's the milk, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh my God, thank you. That would be some kind of magical fairy tale fucking elven world in which everyone's cooperative. To the extent that you can receive criticism this well, do it. It gives you fucking superpowers. And one of the biggest superpowers of all, at the very end, you don't have to do this, but sometimes in some contexts it can really work, is to thank the critic. They did you an unbelievable favor. They showed you through criticism either how you can improve, or how you can understand yourself better to know that this isn't the criticism that's in your top priorities or ever for you to improve. Those are both very useful things. Thank God for the critics. They're doing a big service for which they can be thanked. Thank you so much for letting me know, by the way. Huge. Outside of comment section mega burns, critics have your improvement in mind, and you should be thanking them for being so generous with their criticism. It's the end of the day, the shit is either, meh, you don't care, or it makes you better. Or they're so nasty that eventually they just don't live in your life anymore. That's why um, I don't know where my dad is. He left when I was very young. I'm kidding. He's still around. He's right over there behind the camera. Scott, the video guy is my dad. I'll see you guys next time for more of these videos.